A week from today will perhaps be one of the scariest days of the year in the United States. I'm, of course, talking about Election Day, where the people will go to the polls to vote in local elections, state elections, federal elections, which include the congressional elections, some senatorial elections, and the big one, the presidential election. Now, there's a whole bunch of people running for president in various unusual parties, but we're just going to talk about the six candidates. At the very top, the two-party puppet show, Donald Trump, Republican, Hillary Clinton, Democrat, Gary Johnson, Libertarian, Jill Stein, Green Party, Darrell Castle, Constitution Party, and of course, Evan McMullen, Independent Candidate. Now, some of these candidates will actually be on the ballot in all 50 states. Not all of them, though. So, what happens on Election Day? Well, the people go to vote in the polls, and, well, their vote may or may not count, because... We also have to talk about the Electoral College. That's right. We don't decide who gets to be our president by popular vote. We do that by every other office, congressional, senatorial, state office, local office. All that is done through popular vote. Whoever gets the most popular votes wins at all three levels, except for when it comes to uh, being president. On Tuesday, November 8th, the people will go vote, but... Like I said, their vote may or may not count because we have the Electoral College. Now, how does the Electoral College work? Well, several ways. First off, there's a grand total of 538 e-votes, as I call them, which uh, is broken down like this. 435 based on each 435 congressional districts in the country. 100 votes based on every senator, which means you, know, you get two additional e-votes per state. Then, of course... Three electoral votes for the District of Columbia, which became a thing thanks to the 23rd Amendment. So, there's two ways the Electoral College votes break down. In 48 states, as well as D.C., it's winner take all. Prime example, Texas, the Lone Star State, gets a grand total of 38 e-votes. Now, let's hypothetically say that the election broke down like this. Donald Trump gets 50% of the vote in the Lone Star State. Hillary Clinton gets 30%. Gary Johnson with 20%. Now, because Texas is one of the winner-take-all states, it means that despite the fact that Donald Trump would only get 50% of the vote, he would still get 100% of the e-votes. Now, in other states, it'll be different. Maybe Hillary will do better. Maybe even in one or two Gary Johnson might actually prevail. Maybe, maybe not. But the point is, in these states, if you don't vote for the candidate that gets the most votes, in the end, unfortunately, it seems like your vote really doesn't count. Now, there are two exceptions to this, which include the state of Nebraska and the state of Maine. They have what we call the Congressional District Method. And how the Congressional District Method works is a little different depending on who you ask. And there's a couple different uh, theories, ideas concerning the Congressional District Method. Now, when it comes to Maine and Nebraska, this is how it breaks down. Basically, one elector per congressional district. So for each congressional district in Nebraska and Maine, that is one elector. It counts by itself. Whoever gets the majority vote in that congressional district wins that e-vote. On top of that, each state also gets two additional electors, which is voted statewide by popular vote. Now, in my opinion, I believe that all 50 states, including D.C., should practice the congressional district method when it comes to the um, distribution of electoral votes. That way, it makes people's votes feel like they actually counted towards something instead of saying, oh, well, your candidate only got 47% of the vote, but they still lost. Therefore, your vote doesn't count. Now, out of the 538 electoral votes up for grabs for all presidential candidates on each state throughout the country, along with uh, D.C., the minimum required to win the White House is 270 electoral votes. Now, some presidential candidates are on enough state ballots to qualify for potentially at least 270 votes. Others don't. 
But at the end of the day, when the vote is cast, the electors, I believe it happens a month later in December, even though the night of the election, they say so-and-so got 270 plus E votes, they win, or the other person wins, or maybe nobody wins. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, hypothetically, whoever ends up getting the most electoral votes, as long as it's over 270, is the next president. Now, what happens a month later, each elector gets together, each state, and they cast two votes. First, they cast a vote for president. Then they cast a vote for vice president. This according to the 12th Amendment. Now, what's interesting here is that electors are not required by federal law to honor the pledge. So if their state goes Trump or their state goes Hillary or their state goes Gary Johnson, for example, the elector does not necessarily have to cast their vote for Gary Johnson, Hillary Clinton, or Donald Trump. It's called a faithless elector. And it's happened a few times before, but it's never really made any real big difference. But it is technically a thing. Now, the question you have to ask yourself is, what happens if none of the candidates reach the minimum of 270 e-votes on election day? And this is quite possible because you have two extremely unpopular candidates in Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And it is quite possible that Gary Johnson and Jill Stein, maybe Daryl Castle, as well as McMullen, will pull enough e-votes away from these two candidates that neither Donald Trump or Hillary will be able to get the 270 electoral votes required to win the race. Now, what happens if this actually transpires? Well, according to the 12th Amendment, there are several steps that will be taken should this occur. First off, regarding the U.S. House of Representatives, they will vote on who the next president will be. And what it comes down to is the top three presidential candidates that actually got e-votes. So even if, say, Gary Johnson was to only get electoral votes in one state, like Alaska, for example, then he technically would be in the top three because he was the only other candidate besides Trump or Hillary who got electoral votes. So the vote would go down to the House of Representatives. All three of the candidates, for example, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, and hypothetically Gary Johnson because you would have to have at least one or more of the other candidates winning electoral votes in order to prevent Donald Trump and Hillary from reaching 270 e-votes. But let's just say it's those three. Now, the way it's going to work is despite the fact that the House of Representatives has a grand total of 435 representatives, it's only 50 votes, which means one vote per state. So each uh, group of Congress critters, based on each state, they have to form a delegation, like a delegation of Louisiana, a delegation of New Mexico, a delegation of the state of Washington, New York, etc. And they have to decide who their state is going to vote for. So that probably would result in some debating, depending on how many of them happen to be Republican or Democrat, vice versa. And it has to be like a majority vote per each delegation. And then they cast their vote. And the only way that Donald Trump or Hillary or Gary would actually win in this capacity in the House of Representatives is if one of them get at least 26 votes. 26 votes would win. But the House would continue to vote until someone actually got 26 votes between those three. Now, you may be asking yourself, well, how is the vice president decided? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's done over in the Senate which has 100 votes, one vote per senator. And what they do is they take the top two senators, which would most likely be Pence and Kane. So they would put Pence and Kane head to head in the Senate. The Senate would debate it, discuss it. Then they would cast their votes and they would continue to do so until they got a 51 majority. So whoever got a 51 majority between Pence and Kane would be the next president. So hypothetically, you could have a a different party of the vice president and a different party of the president. So you could have Donald Trump 
as president. You could have Cain as vice president. You could have Hillary as president. You could have Pence as vice president. You could have Gary Johnson as president or Pence or Cain as his vice president. So we could go down any sort of interesting way when it comes to the way that it's decided if Trump or Hillary or no one else manages to get the minimum of 270 electoral votes. But it goes a step further. What if there is nobody that makes the cut by Inauguration Day, January 20th, 2017? This leads to a deadlock election. So until Congress can vote on who the next president is going to be, until the House of Representatives get to that 26 minimum between Hillary, Trump, Gary Johnson, that means there has to be an acting president as of January 20th, 2017. So it would come down to whoever wins in the Senate as vice president, whether it's Pence or Kane. However, let's just say the Senate's having the same issue as the House. Well, then it comes down to the current Speaker of the House, the third most powerful office in the country. At the moment, the Speaker of the House is Paul Ryan. So if the Senate cannot decide on who the next vice president is, and if the House of Representatives can't decide on who the next president is, then that means that the acting president, until that's decided, would be Speaker of the House Paul Ryan. Now, another interesting tidbit is that Paul Ryan is in a very heavily contested race right now, and it's quite possible next week he could actually lose. So it's very interesting to see how this is all going to possibly play out next week when America goes to the polls. Now, let me know below in the comments section your thoughts regarding the Electoral College. Should we keep it? Should we wad it up and toss it away? Or should we modify it to where all the states follow the congressional district method?